You're listening to Galaxy of Film. And welcome back to the Brain Oops of Galaxy of Film. I'm, of course, your host, Max. And this week, I'm not alone, thankfully, but I'm joined by none other than our man, Curtis. How are you doing, brother? Man, I'm always doing good, brother. How are you doing? So far, so good, man. You know, doing a, a lot of work this week on the next short film, Goonies and Agony. You know, it's it's been hectic. We were up until about 6 a.m. last night, this morning. Yeah. I was just getting up for work around that time, man. Yeah, yeah, it was rough. It was rough. <laughs> but <laughs> long nights um, on this incredible set we've secured. Great cast and crew. Dude, I'm, I'm so excited to get this piece out. You have no clue. Sweet. Man. I'm excited for you, man. I appreciate it, bro. I appreciate it. What's new with you, man? I know you are talking about the conventions around a couple weeks ago, of course. You're always a big convention guy here. Oh, yeah. Just finished my last one of the year, so we're finally taking a break for a while. Mm. Uh, which is good, because we're finally taking a break from driving, uh, which is good. Other than that, man, just kind of chilling. We're finally getting that podcast of mine started. We're just waiting to hear back from our artist. Okay. And then okay. once we get that taken care of, we're good to go pretty much. Very nice, man. Glad you got the wheels turning going on. That's yes, awesome. Sir. Very nice. And thankfully, we're still not alone. We got our man, Johnny Zuko. How are you doing, brother? Good, good, man. Uh, just another day. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I got a dog. So like my dog's been keeping me up mm. all day all night man it's like i want to play i want to play i want to play it's like okay we'll play and then all of a sudden he takes a takes a mad piss right in the hallway i'm like what are you doing <laughs> that's I just awesome wanna, i just wanna i'm gonna i'm just i just had to kick him out it's like go away go away what kind of dog like, is it on. um it's like a pit bull mixed with a labradoodle oh okay, that's an interesting combination okay yeah, yeah. I, I think there's something else in there though, because it's the snout that that really throws me off. So ah, I think wow. there's something. I think he's mixed with something else. But the pound said he was straight pit bull. That that's not right though. He oh, has a body pit bull, but he does not have a face as a pit. There you go. I'm proud of you for rescuing too, man. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, had to do it. So <laughs> no, there you go. <laughs> had to do it. Well, this week, guys, we also have a very special guest with us here. Uh, we actually have the creator of the Final Destination series, Jeffrey Reddick. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Um, I mean, who am I kidding? It's like two. It's like, yeah, it's middle of the week. Not much going on. No, I, I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm doing well. I just I want to make it sound more exciting than it is. No, I understand that. <laughs> For sure. There's construction going on outside, so maybe a, a big wrecking ball will come smashing through behind me, and that'll... <laughs> that'll <laughs> There's your opening piece for your next Final Destination. I know. Right? I know. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and kind of dive straight into it this week. Um, like I said, you are the creator of the Final Destination series. Um, but, you know, something that, you know, a lot of people don't really know about you that I think is super interesting. Um, you actually wrote, as a teenager, a sequel to Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm very <laughs> curious to what this sequel, like, contained in your mind for well, it was a it was a prequel, so oh, prequel, that, excuse me. yes, yes. So the only reason I say that, no, but I have to give a little context. I was fourteen, mm -hmm. um, living in Eastern Kentucky, mm -hmm. and I had just seen a Nightmare on Elm Street with my best friend sitting on his dad's truck with a CB on, watching it over the fence of the drive, <laughs> the, the drive <laughs> of the drive drive um, drive-in theater because we couldn't afford to pay for the tickets. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, so didn't know anything about the movie business. Um, I just saw the movie and it blew me away. Like it's my favorite movie of all time. It's influenced oh. my career in, in so many ways, just creatively, but also like really cemented my love for horror films. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I went home and I banged out a prequel idea. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, 14 year old Hillbilly, um, it's not going to be that, you know, it was Freddy Krueger, the mm -hmm. janitor, like killing some kids at a high school. I made it, I, I aimed it up to high school. Um, okay. Just because I wasn't gonna, yeah, it's like I, I didn't want him killing little kids, and I'm a little kid myself. <laughs> um, yeah, but he was killing some kids, and then the parents. Were, it was a very, it's what you would expect a 14 year old to write. Sure, um, sure. But the funny part of the story is, you know, I was like, this is a great idea, and so I was like, I found out 
Bob that Bob Shea ran the production company New Line Cinema, and this was right before they blew up. You know, because Nightmare on Elm Street really put them on the map. And mm -hmm. um, I mailed my idea to him, and he sent it back because he's like, "We don't read unsolicited material." And I'm like, I don't know what unsolicited means. So I looked it up and I'm like, well, fuck this. So I wrote him back and I'm like, uh, look, sir, I spent $3 on your movies. So I think you can take three minutes to read my my story. Mm -hmm. And he read it and he got back to me and him and his assistant, Joy Mann, over the years would send me like scripts for, for movies, send me like little tchotchkes that she, Joy taught me what tchotchkes meant, but like little mm -hmm. toys from the movies and just really kept me like, inspired to really do this sure and and in bob's letter he was like you know you have a great imagination you know he goes but study you know study screenwriting format and structure you know so he wanted me to learn the you know basics of it and mm -hmm. um i stayed in touch with them till uh, i was 19 and i was going to college in berea kentucky and i got a summer internship at the american academy of dramatic arts um in new york for the summer mm -hmm. and so while i was there they brought me on as an intern at New Line. And then I ended up getting an agent that summer. And I'm like, oh, screw this. Hollywood's <laughs> making it as easy. So I'm going to quit mm -hmm. school and stay in New York. Um, cut to <laughs> many, many, many years later, mm -hmm. um, many passed on projects by New Line, but they ended up making Final Destination. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it's a fun story to tell, but there's a lot of stretches in there where it's like, I was waiting tables and eating ramen noodles at, at living in a YMCA for years, you know, many of those, many <laughs> sure. of those years um, in between. But yeah, mm. I kind of always credit, you know, first of all, Bob's, you, you know, reaching out and, and his assistant Joy for reaching out and staying in touch with me. I mean, I was calling the collect. I didn't know any better. I was calling Joy collect from Kentucky oh, wow. and she was taking the charges. Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> like, That's I was good. like, a, that was a little friggin' pain in the butt. So, mm. um, but, you know, again, it, it was it was kind of the nice convergence of like the right movie to inspire me, you know, me just going with my gut when I was like 14 hmm. and them kind of being receptive. And then I, I just learned a lot over the years because, um, again, it, there were a lot of movies that and scripts that I wrote it that are ideas that I pitched that didn't get picked up. And so I learned from every one of those when I kind of started the final destination journey with them absolutely that's beautiful to hear that you literally took a chance as a you know as a kid basically within your favorite franchise your favorite series of course it's still very small still at this time but regardless you're taking a chance of something you're really you know interested in and it worked out for you you know it helped shape yeah. your own career i love that yeah man, curtis imagine if something like that happened for us for star wars <laughs> yeah, bro here's hoping man it's always the dream brother well, right. the key, key element of the story is persistence. So absolutely, yeah. oh, for be sure. persistent. Absolutely, I love that. Especially sticking it to him, man. It's like three minutes of my every time to read my script. I love that. I know, I know. <laughs> and I and I, I was I don't even think I was a jerk about it. But when he did write back, I remember he said, "Thank you for your aggressive introduction." So I guess maybe it did come across <laughs> as a little, little aggro. <laughs> well, if you watch a lot of Bob Shea interviews, like he appreciates people that are kind of aggressive and like yeah, you know, no, I you know, that are willing to put themselves out there. So like you know, Bob yeah, Shea appreciates stuff like that. Yeah, That's he's awesome. one of the last. You know, like when I started working there, it was the pr prime of this when the studio system, I mean, Bob loved movies. He took a chance on Nightmare on Elm Street. He took chances on on films like that were original and different. And you don't see that with the studio as much anymore. Like where, you know, you have film lovers running the, the plays and they're making creative choices. Now a lot of them are, are making business choices. So I was kind of there in the heyday. So I got spoiled a little bit about, sure. you know, how. But I also learned so much that I've, it's kind of helped keep me sane and not bitter <laughs> over the decades working in this freaking business. That's awesome. So you, you mentioned Nightmare on Elm Street is your favorite movie of all time. It's been the inspiration yes. for your career. Um, what are a couple other films within the horror that have kind of inspired you throughout the years to keep going with the Final Destination specifically? Yeah, there were a lot. There were a lot of things that I fell in love with. When I, I mean, when I was young, me and my friends, I mean, we were teenagers, so we were always just looking for like the bloodiest sure most disgusting movies because everybody would be like how can you watch that stuff and we're like because we're cool um so you know the all you know we grew up watching all the friday 13th and anything that came out in the 70s 80s you know into the mm -hmm. 90s like we're finding the bloodiest ones but some of the ones that kind of 
have stood out. I mean, the classics, obviously, like the Halloweens, you mm -hmm. know, those are the classics. But I think some of the the movies that were different that really stood out for me is I love Suspiria. Um, saw that movie and was a, just beautiful. Just I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, love Demons too. Um, okay. Uh, saw Candyman when I was in college, and that movie is like seminal for me as well. I can tell. Um, I can tell. <laughs> um, love Candyman. Uh, love Night of the Living Dead. And mm. um, it's so funny because people ask me for sometimes I do these lists and I and I and and um, it's usually the same ones. And I but there's one I'm forgetting. Yeah, there. I mean, there. Okay. <laughs> it, it's. I love all the standard mm. ones but then the, the kind of the ones that stood out because they were unique for me at the time like phantasm but suspiria you know again Candyman showed me a just again a, was such a smart mm -hmm. smart movie not that the other ones weren't but it just had a lot going on and virginia madsen and and tony todd and casey lemons and xander but like the whole cast is just and, and the score is incredible too for Candyman as well oh yeah so yeah dope. Candyman also for shows that, especially in horror, could have depth to to its storytelling. I think yeah, that's absolutely. What does prove and it does very yeah. well, you know, because when you think about the '90s, you think about like those '90s thrillers like Misery, Silence of the Lambs. But Candyman was one that could show you like you can have a supernatural movie and still have like massive depth to your story. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And Silence of the Lambs, I kind of count that as a horror movie too. Like that, I can't. I have a very wide. <laughs> <laughs> array of what i can say I, th I think if something scares you and gets under your skin it's a horror movie um sure but yeah there, i mean i i just grew up on all, like so many of them but i think the thing that struck me about nightmare on elm street was it was i remember that the commercial was like a new masterpiece in fantasy horror and i'd never heard of that term mm. to describe a horror film as fantasy horror and looking back of course phantasm i think would fall under that realm and there's other films that would as well but i think nightmare on elm street was the first kind of mainstream movie to make that reality bending world and and aside from freddy krueger being a great villain mm -hmm. you know nancy i think you know as a character was probably the first the strongest final girl that i'd ever seen up to that point in in horror franchises yeah, you know i love jamie sure. lee i love jamie lee like i love all the classic scream queens but nancy was the first character that kind of knew what was going figured out something was going on from the beginning like actively investigated it was yeah, like i'm gonna go into my dream and i'm gonna go in my dream and pull this fucker out and fight like she she was like the final girl i was like i've never seen a leading lady like this mm. in a horror movie absolutely and you still kind of don't though when you really think about it because i think nancy is very um very rare you don't see that all that much you know yeah it took it took sydney a couple movies to get to that proactive yeah you know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. Nancy from the get, she was proactive. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't see that uh, very often. I don't know why that is. Yeah. No, it's pretty interesting because I I because I love Nev Campbell as well, but you're absolutely right. Like the first movie, she's she is very reactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And even in the second movie, she's kind of reactive. But it's also that's I guess that's probably the a little bit of the the arc. The arc, but also if you're dealing in slot like a slasher movie, maybe you don't have the time to have you know unless it's like the stereotypical like super meek girl who has to become a warrior by the end of the movie that kind of arc for for it but yeah um, but yeah nancy i i still think nancy is like the like gold standard um in horror you know obviously ripley was great and mm. in aliens um but still you she didn't do ripley all as a, as a as a final girl though like that's that's i've always found that that debate interesting is Ripley a, a, as a final girl. I never considered her as a final girl until I saw someone on TikTok make the argument that Alien and Aliens is a horror movie and we should consider Ripley among like Lori and Nancy. In, in, uh, yeah. Those, but I, most people don't. I, I, most I people don't. That. And I, again, for, for me, it, and again, that's why I think, you know, it's how you describe horror is certainly like personal because that is more of a sci fi thriller in the second one's more of an action movie um but i i still think it can fall you know i'm a, i'm a very you know wide open very broad range person yeah yeah <laughs> man you but guys are gonna hate me get, i've never seen that very, actually like, 
Oh huh? my god! I actually never seen Alien. You guys are gonna hate me. <laughs> oh, we're not Wait, gonna hate either? you. But you should watch it. I know, I know, man. John, it's been on the list for forever. It's so just good. one of those things where, like, I'll watch it and we'll we'll do an episode on it one day. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I can't um, think of anything new that should push it down any further on your list. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> And real quick, because you kind of mentioned stuff about Candyman as well with this too, and kind of that being one of your big like inspiration films. Um, with that being said, what was it like getting Tony Todd to be in Final Destination for? Like, how big of a moment was that for you? Um, I flipped the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> I flipped the fuck out. Um, you know, and it, and the thing is, like, I wasn't really involved because I lived in New York and it was mm-hmm. shot in Kansas. I wasn't really involved in a lot of the casting. I I know before the movie got into production, you know, one of my, one of my big things that, and I pushed this again from the beginning when I wrote it, because I'm like, it's set in New York. So let's just make sure that we have some diversity in the cast because Mm -hmm. I live in New York and, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of different, different people here. Um, And so I had had that conversation with the producer a long time, and this is no slight on, on the, on anybody. But, you know, I saw the cast of Teenagers and I was like, eh, didn't listen. But I love the cats. Love them. Mm. But I remember Bob Bob was like, yeah, what about Tony Todd? I'm like, are you fucking candy man? Are you what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's yes. perfect, too. And I've gotten to be friends with him over the years. And he is just such a such an amazing actor and an amazing person, like, you know, they said never meet your heroes. And I've been so fortunate, like 99.9% of the, my heroes that I've met have been awesome. Um, and That's he good. is like just such a, and he takes his work very seriously. Like he's not, he mm-hmm. never, you know, we, we had him in a film, um, the final wish for like, you know, a day shoot. And, you know, he took that role as seriously as he would have if he had, you know, if it was the leading role of the film. Um, that's beautiful to hear i like i gotta love that kind of like work ethic truly if it comes yeah to film. You know, yeah that's beautiful. so so yeah that was that was one of the that was one of the biggest bright spots of you know I mean, there's many you mm-hmm. know of the whole franchise but but getting tony todd it was because i again i just took me right back to me and my friend going up to see Candyman, you know in college and just being blown away by him and seeing his other work as well he's done so much more yeah but um I was just like, oh, that would be amazing. Or that, yeah. And he's still going too. I mean, he was obviously oh, yeah. you just recently Venom yeah. in the new Spider Man game too, which is, you know, a big hit. So it's, yeah. I'm so happy he's still going on strong. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he w- works hard and I, I, I've never met anybody because it's a small business, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes people will work with, uh, you know, you'll hear this person's an asshole or this person's a jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they still keep working, but. I've never met anybody that's had a bad thing to say about him. So somebody with a good work ethic and talent and mm. I mean, it's Tony Todd. So. Yeah, just checking all the boxes, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to ask, um, was, is there any truth or at least in your um, version of Final Destination that Tony Todd was going to play the like death, like the personification of death? Or was that just an idea that came up later as the franchise went on? Like, did you think that um, he was going to be death or was he just supposed to just like oh it's just like a nice cameo i don't think there i, I mean let me put it because um because i wrote like the the version the studio bought in that i i wrote the first draft it was very nightmare on elm street influenced okay. so um we we fought forever about not showing anything to do with death in the for the studio and they were like we this doesn't make any sense and so like when i the version that i sold them like we did have like an angel of death appear Oh, okay. To kind That's of get them to buy it. Yeah, I w- it was kind of like we were forced to do it. <laughs> we, <laughs> we didn't want to show death. Okay. Um, so, and death also killed them in a night, very like mind fuck with them because it couldn't just come back and kill them. So there were all these like Nightmare on Street set pieces where they committed suicides. So mm-hmm. that was a little mm-hmm. dark. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> so, so James Wong and Glenn Morgan came up with the, the idea that death was like, you know, that, this Rube Goldbergish kind of force that that used everyday things to kill you, which I think is actually brilliant because that I think it opened it up for more than just the mm. horror audiences. Like I think the Nightmare on Elm Street version would have was still really good, like, but it would have just it. I don't think it would have spread as wide as it did without, you know, with an sure. angel of death with an angel of death thing in there. Um, 
so in in in, in my script there was a Tony Toddish character who mm -hmm. had had like the same thing had happened to him before, but and he he was lurking around kind of creepy, and he finally he was the one that told Alex that death was coming for them, and then Alex figured out death's design, you know, that they were being killed in the order that they would have died in the crash. So yeah. that was kind of the function of that character in my draft. Um, and I think with James and Glenn's draft, like, you know, I, I've just heard them talk about it. I think they intentionally wanted it to be nebulous as to how he's knows all this stuff, like he's connected. Mm. Um, and then when we worked on the second movie, you know, we decided we were going to kind of with the story, we were going to kind of just play with that vague notion that he knows things mm -hmm. but we're not we're not sure he just always works close to death and so we saw that that was something that the fans were kind of responding to like trying to question so we you know we decided not to give any definitive answers mm -hmm. on on what his connection was but um he never himself was going to be death um okay. as far as is his character in the in the in the finished film um and I know in that, you know, again, in my version, that character was more of somebody who had experienced, you know, it's like, who, why is this strange guy following us around? Is he, is he killing us? And and then he, you find out that he'd been through what Alex had been through. So that character, mm -hmm. yeah, was 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 different. It was different in my script. So I don't think I don't think he's ever been the I think the vague the vagity of it is something yeah, we all kind of of Tony Todd's character. It actually because it leads to a lot of fun fan theories also about his character. It's it's really fun when you go on on Reddit or like on the message board and read about his the theories about his character. Like, oh, he's death. He knows everything. He's low key. He's he's this and that. It, I just find that yeah. interesting. And then yeah. you read that oh, there was an idea later on in the franchise to actually make it death. So I, I just wanted to know if that was part of the original idea or if that was just if that just came on later because of the fan theories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I don't. Uh, yeah, def I don't. Well, definitely, we didn't plan to make him death. Um, and I think if again, if I think in in all worlds, if we if we had our way, like there probably would have never been anything. Because even in the even in the final ascension movie, you know, there's there are a couple of scenes where you see like that black shadow mm -hmm. kind of go across the yeah. curtain or go across. The, so you know, they, you know, from that the studio kind of made that choice to have that put in there because they were. They they were just like we got to show something. <laughs> um, <laughs> I get that. I get that. That's awesome though. I'm really happy you know have that love for Tony Todd and kind of seeing uh you know that character's influence over the years too. It's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. But let's go ahead and take a quick break, guys. We're gonna go over our stream of the week. We also got uh, Shamim coming on for a quick segment for you guys too. And when we come back, we're gonna go ahead and talk about Final Destination. And oh, hi, Mark. Coming in for a quick little between the yeah, breaks segment. Filming. We got the man himself, Shamim, the autograph king, our director of fan relations here at Galaxy of Film. How are you doing, brother? I'm good. I'm good. So this has been a long, a long friendship where Jeffrey. So how do exactly meet? Anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, we met. Um, we met. It's been years since we met, but I know. Did through I, rain because we were both Baha'is. Um, yeah. So we met online because we yeah we yeah. belong to the same same faith. There it is. And, and then yeah um, yeah it, we started talking it, online and I found out he was a big autograph king. <laughs> yeah, um, for real man. <laughs> and an awesome guy. So yeah, we just stayed in touch and then when he came out to L.A. Uh, we met for dinner and hung yeah, out. And was we, like almost eight years jeffrey can you believe it eight yeah, years it doesn't, doesn't feel like that long <laughs> yeah how did the, the the test screening go for final destination now uh, jeffrey do you remember at all um the test screening for the original yeah um it went well they just didn't like the original ending because it was too <laughs> happy, so they went back and reshot the ending for that one mm. which which so, i think made all the difference in the world so here to promote you buddy 
Yeah. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. So in your, yeah, in so your, in your, your, in your project. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, um, we got Anthony Zizi in the film. Actually, we got him. He okay. he came down um, to Daily Ground, did did a segment. Mm-hmm. We got um, yeah Craig Miller recently too. Yeah, Craig Miller. We mm-hmm. have um, who else? Um, Debbie Derry Barry. I think you know her, right, mm-hmm. Jeffrey? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be amazing if we can get Dolly. That would be interesting <laughs> to have her in the film. <laughs> And she mean what? How? What is? What are we look, expecting for the autograph king to drop? Because we're we're keep moving um, on with production for it too. I know we're getting well, closer and closer. According to Scott, uh, he said uh, he's trying to get into film festivals. Um, okay. Mid January. Um, so, yeah. Last thing, Jeffrey. So, what would you, if if you could pick a, a person, living or dead, uh, who would you meet and why? Photo or autograph and why? I I want to meet Oprah. That'd be cool. That'd yeah, be cool, right? Oprah. She's awesome. That'd be cool. She's inspired me so a lot. So she's she's on my bucket list. Okay. There you go. What about your white white whale? What would you pick, Oprah? Like, well, I wouldn't call her a white whale, Shamim. No, no, I I <laughs> I know, I'm saying, I know, yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Shmi, we gotta go ahead and wrap this up, man. It's been great Alrighty. to get you on here, like always, brother. Um, yeah, like check always. out the Autograph King coming out soon, guys. The show reel links is down below. Go ahead and show us love to this trailer, guys. Look, working very hard over it. You and Scott are doing a great job with this film. So, thanks for coming yeah. on, buddy. All right, buddy. It was great seeing you, Shmi. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. This is the Kari Holder reporting to you live right about now from Galaxy Film Headquarters broadcasting territory, this time YouTube territory. And today for Stream of the Week, I'm going to talk to you guys about a little film that has had a pretty significant impact on me when it comes to how I look at horror films since it came out. That film is Hereditary, Ari Aster's seminal directorial debut in my opinion i've seen many horror films growing up in my life but none that i've seen has affected me and just floored me on this level excellent craftsmanship you feel every second of the slow descent into spiritual madness every frame counts every line of dialogue counts everything counts in this movie it's possibly my favorite horror film if you haven't seen it i do highly recommend it Alright guys, and we're back from our break. First up, we're going to go ahead and talk about Final Destination. Uh, This film, of course, came out in the year 2000. Um, And a little bit of a recap, we have Alex, who's kind of like the lead of this film. Um, A group of these young teens who are in high school going on a field trip. Um, They're going to go ahead and get ready to board this plane to France, actually, for this trip. And suddenly he gets a vision, more or less. Kind of like a That's So Raven moment of this whole plane crash happening and basically everyone dying. Like sucked out, plane catching on fire, exploding in the air, pretty traumatic stuff. Um, thankfully this is a vision, he kind of snaps out of it and then freaks out um, and then everyone kind of gets off the plane, his little group, his, his you know whole gang from school. Um, as they're arguing in the airport, because obviously this is kind of suspicious activity, the plane explodes and so they're all kind of under question and all the FBI is kind of watching them and going on. Uh, it's actually death kind of comes in and is starting to take out these kids one by one and the only one who can kind of realize what's going on at first is Alex. Um, he kind of gets these visions continuously seeing the order of people dying from what order they were died on the plane. Um, and yeah, so going on through this just death kind of knocks out everybody with kind of household ordinary objects and whatnot. Um, so yeah, Curtis, I'm really curious for you, man, because you and I are same age group. We were kids and this came out. I mean, I was a year old at this point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, what was the first time you watched the first Final Destination? I, it might have been years and years ago. Okay. Maybe when I was like 13 or 14, still pretty young-ish. Okay. And I think there's like a marathon of like all the movies, like back to back to back on like HBO or something. Mm-hmm. And I was like, 
especially the first one, I really like the idea of death itself is like, like taxes. You don't cheat me. I'm going to get my due. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, the creative ways these these kills happened, I thought was super interesting. I never seen like a horror movie like that. Because I was definitely a bit more in the um, slasher ways, like more like the traditional like horror movie kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And supernatural stuff really never got to me that much. I don't know. Something about the first one, especially, was very. I don't know cultural cultural significant to where it's one of those things where like it really questioned, made a lot of people question like, oh, is my house good? <laughs> Maybe I should leave the water running. Yeah. Uh, these weird questions. I just thought it was really cool that like even after every move, and even though the more ridiculous they got. Mm. I thought it was always a good kind of like conversation starter of like, oh, what was your favorite kill of this one? Or what was your favorite one of this? I don't know. I just, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, they're all memorable. It's kind of like a, almost like a Home Alone kind of saw trap type of deal. Oh, it's exactly. It's a bit more yeah. ordinary. You know, obviously no one's being kidnapped. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, man, this is funky. I discovered Found Destination when I discovered YouTube, actually. And it was one of those things where all the kind of deaths were broken up over different clips and uploads. Um, and it, I think the first time I watched this in its entirety, I was in high school. Um, but yeah, I'd seen every kill on YouTube really young, like fifth grade or sixth grade. Um, and it was just one of those things. I remember we were actually, there was this like after school program. It wasn't like a club and it wasn't like a, uh, like a prime time kind of thing. But it was just a thing in middle school that we had where you can kind of hang out for an extra hour and a half. They had a couple of weeks, you could play games, you could buy snacks there. Um, it was I just kind of like the key. And I think you're in detention. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a fun detention, man. It was like a fun detention. Like, we're gonna right. hold you here. Uh, make you stay. I'm kidding. <laughs> it was like a it was like a breakfast club, but not against your will kind of deal. <laughs> was hanging out, um, and I remember vividly. It was called Student Union, actually, and we're chilling in there on the on obviously the dinosaur PC stuff. We got in there, um, and half the kids are playing Happy Wheels. And on the other side of the computer screen, as we're watching Final Destination deaths back and forth on like three different PCs, we got screamed at with a librarian because of how much gore is being put on the screen. <laughs> so, yeah, weird instance, you know, having a first experience of this film. Um, but Johnny, what about you, man? What was the first time you watched this one? Uh, I saw this in the 2000, I think 2001 when it came out on DVD. I had just missed it in theater. Um, okay. We had, I think my stepdad had have blind, blind bought this movie and got it on DVD and we watched it as a family. <laughs> and uh, we just like, this is really fun. Like, what the fuck? This is interesting. But it, it also scared us. You know, we, we were 10 and it also frightened us also. So it did its job of like really scaring us. I was, I think I was about, I was a freshman in high school when I saw this movie and I thought I had like seen it all and I have it. And I saw this movie. I was like, holy shit, this is this is awesome. I mm-hmm. think this was the movie that actually kind of reignited my love for horror because in the nineties, like it was really tough. Even though I defend nineties horror a lot, it 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 is really tough to go through nineties horror and say, Oh, there's some really good movies there. But I think Final Destination really reignited my love for horror and then I just started going to like the video store and just running every horror movie I could because of Final Destination. Beautiful, and, uh, man. yeah, man. Beautiful. I, I love this movie. It's so much fun, and it's and I think it's I think out of all of them, I think this one's held up the best because of the the practical effects. Um, when you get to some other ones, it, they don't hold up as well. Mm-hmm. I feel yeah. you. That's beautiful. I'm glad it kind of re you know ignited your uh, your passion for horror. That's awesome. So Jeffrey, obviously you wrote this piece. I'm really curious, um, you know, about your first experience watching this one in particular. What is it like for you seeing, you know, something you wrote but you weren't directing kind of deal come to life for the first time? Something you worked so hard over for the years and fought so hard to make. Um, it was great, and I, I you know, again, like the version, the the final shooting script was like mm-hmm. written by James Wong and Glenn Morgan. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there there was the enough of the the whole story like the dna yeah, yeah. of the story That's was mine I mean. and so it was you know so i got story credit and sh- sole story credit and shared screenplay credit at the end of the day um mm. but but having been through the whole process like that's again i think what was so 
great about working at New Line is I knew development was a process because things change. Like originally they were going to be adults. Mm -hmm. um, and then Scream came out. Scream is one of my favorites too. I forgot to mention that one. Um, but Scream came out and the studio was like, well, teenagers are hot now. Let's make them all teenagers. So I, I was used to like, as long as something makes it better, I have no problem with it changing. Yeah, sure. So I was, I kind of went through the whole development process, you know, with James and Glenn's script as well. And so to finally see it on screen and it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And then, you know, obviously my, my first feature credit, mm -hmm. you know, kind of have my, my name up there twice, you know, <laughs> was like, <laughs> sweet. Um, and yeah, so I, we saw, I saw a couple, a couple of rough cuts of it. Mm. um and then i yeah i saw the final cut of it so uh and then we had a premiere like the studio like in instead of going to the la premiere i uh asked the studio if they would do a premiere in my there was a theater like right next to my town like that drive-in had shut down mm. long ago but there was a, a theater in hazard K kentucky which is near where i grew up um so i asked them if they would just do a premiere there like you know buy the theater out and give refreshments and stuff so we had a premiere you know by my hometown Aww. so i got to have my mom and my sister and my friends and stuff and we all got to watch it together so that that was like an experience i won't forget like it was really special that's awesome to hear actually that's what we're doing for, uh, for my next film i got the theater running out my hometown as well so that's really that's cool amazing yeah oh I yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna and i also got to take my teacher um because uh, you know education is very important to me my mom mm. been really instilled that and i had an english teacher all my english teachers inspired me um, but I had one in particular who really pushed me to like study acting and, and I told her like, if I ever had a movie made, I'd bring her the premiere of it. Um, so we actually flew her out to New York. Mm -hmm. We were on the Rosie O'Donnell show at the beginning, you know, where Rosie would have an audience member throw like the coos yeah, or yeah. whatever. So yeah, me and my English teacher, we were on the, mm -hmm. you know, we brought her out for that and she got to be on the Rosie. She wanted to meet Rosie and she got, to, so we did that and, um, took her to a Broadway show so that was like special too just because again I wanted to you know I I made that promise to my teacher yeah I, I love that wanted to, you know I think teachers are you know have always kind of gotten the short end of the stick you know <laughs> and, have, and, man. and um and it, they're so important so there's a lot of special personal memories around the first one that sure are more than just oh the movie you know I love that too. That's, that's also like coming with me because I also invited a teacher of mine, a history teacher in high <laughs> school. Her name is Miss Payne. Shout out to you, Miss Payne, if you're listening to this. Uh, but it means the world to me that she's coming, man, because she was also really pushing me to keep hash or pushing through a film. Because um, yeah. she kind of recognized, like, I, I didn't care a lot in school about certain subjects and whatnot. Not saying yeah. I was on the verge of dropping out or anything like that, but she was yeah. definitely like, you know, this is what you're meant to do. Do it. You know? That's why I think it's really super, not to get off track, but I think that's why mm. it's really important that we keep the arts programs alive in schools because mm. the way schools are set up now, it's like if you, if you don't play sports, there's really a lot, not a lot of, you know, extracurricular activities for you to do. Mm. And that's just, that's where a lot of problems come up, especially with younger kids in like rural areas or the, or inner cities. Like if, if you don't give them something to do to like express their passions or get excited about then they get bored and then they start looking for other stuff to entertain themselves and that's when you can have a lot of issues with like crime and shit like that it's like you know i really wish they would push the arts even more than they do because it's such an outlet for any type of you know whether it's acting or painting or writing or music you know, even absolutely 100 music real yeah fun, man. Yeah, hundred percent. Wood agree. carving, you know, in Kentucky, everybody does crafts there, and it's like you know they should have, you know, there's so many different ways to express yourself, and and mm. yeah, that'd be cool. I remember when I loved wood shop in middle school. I have this cool lamp in my yeah. room actually. It's a, a VHS. I hollowed out a copy of Empire Strikes Back, put it into a lamp. It's pretty awesome. Oh, that's yeah. Nice. We had wood shop at my school too, which yeah. was really cool. Ah. Man, got me going through memory lane, man. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to Final Destination. Um, another question I have for you real quick, Jeffrey, before we get wrapped up on this one to talk about uh, the next film, of course. Uh, what were some of your inspirations for the kills in this piece? Because I think it's super interesting that you mentioned, like, yeah, these are kind of like everyday household items, you know? Yeah. The toilet's leaking, and that causes him to slip, and, you know, get caught up in the the piece around the shower drain. And we have, you know, the finishing blow is the chair hitting into the knife that's in her chest. 
What was yeah. some of your inspirations for oh, those directly? Right. Yeah. Well, for that, again, I have to give all credit to James and Glenn for the, because they, again, in my, in, in my draft, it was like the, the guy that got hung in the shower, like in my, in my version, mm -hmm. again, Nightmare on Elm Street influence. Uh, oh, that's that, right. My apology. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 mm -hmm. apologize though. But like in the, in the, in my version, like that character, you know, his father was like a preacher and okay. he was he'd been stealing some stuff some money from the school and stuff like that and and mm -hmm. or from the church and was like you know doing a typical bad preacher son so <laughs> in in my version of the script he his father's coming home and we see him being like haunted by all these like creepy shit at his house and mm -hmm. his father's driving home and he gets a call from todd and todd's just like apologizing and the guy's like freaking out and the dad's driving home faster and and his, his son's like, I'm sorry, forgive me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And when the, the dad hits the garage door opener, we realize that Todd's hung, rigged a noose up in the garage. So when his dad opens the garage door, like, oh, it hangs him. Shit, that's fucking so, That's fucking gnarly. That's so, metal as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. I may have, no. to, I may have to use that in mad. another movie. <laughs> I may have to mad. use that in another, another movie. But, you know, <laughs> when you take out the Nightmare on Elm Street elements and you go with like, you know the more realistic stuff i actually think the when people ask me like what my the death that bothers me the most like it gets under my skin but most it is the film version of todd's <laughs> death because okay. the act chad is such a good actor and it's just such a realistic painful thing like he's almost gets away and and so that death actually really resonates with me um and, you know, in my version, there was like a subway train, you know, that a, a character mm -hmm. gets smashed by. So, so there's the film versions are different. Okay, um, gotcha, I got you. My bad. Yeah. But I, like I said, I think that that whole Rube Goldberg M MO for death, like, mm -hmm. I think changing up death's MO, like, really helped with it. Okay. The movie have like legs outside of the genre. So, um, but I do think it's funny, you know, I'm just, um, you know, I, I, I can't put myself in their heads, but, I, the funny thing I love is I think Kristen Cloak's a great actress um, that plays, uh, she's married to Glenn Morgan. And I love that she gets killed the most. Like, she gets the fuck killed out of her. It's like, thing in the throat, blown up, <laughs> knives. Mm. <laughs> the absolute knives. shit out of her. I was like, I was like, you know, if I'm ever, you know, if I'm ever, like, married by the time I, you know, get to do one of these movies and I get to put my husband in a film, then I'll... I'm gonna be like, yeah, I'm gonna murder you the most in this movie. Yeah, we're, we're gonna that's have awesome. Well, I'm gonna make yeah. it last. I think her, I think yeah. best thing was five minutes long or something like that. I know it's like the it's the it's the it's, it's the I, most I'm intricate like, too. And now that I think yeah. about it. You yeah. can definitely tell, like, Danny Leone has took some inspiration for that for Terrifier, <laughs> for sure. Oh, <laughs> he's had. I to, wanted man. to ask before we had move on that. Is, is there any truth that you had gotten this idea from a news segment that a woman called her husband and said, don't get on the plane, and that's what inspired you to write the uh, it, write, write Final Destination? It was, uh, it was, I was actually flying home to Kentucky, and I read an, an article, and I think it was in People Magazine, but it was about a woman that was on vacation, and her mom called her and said, don't take the flight you're on tomorrow, I have a bad feeling about it. So I read that article, and it just put the idea in my head. Like it was like mm. the kernel of the idea. I didn't know what to do with it, but I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then later on it hit me like, oh, what if that woman missed her time to die? And then it turned into what if she cheated death? And that's where the Kentucky also came. That's where the log truck scene came from. Like we had this general story worked out um, and er Eric Bress and J. Mackie Gruby also worked on the story and wrote the script for that one. But the opening, like it was going to be a hotel fire and the producer's like, uh, we need so something, something catchier. And I was going home to Kentucky again, and I was got behind a log truck, and I pulled over to the next lane like I always did. And then I pulled off the freeway, and I called Craig, and I'm like, what about a log truck on a freeway? And he's like, that's fucking it. That's the that's opening. That's it. So it's it like, sticks, too. Everyone yeah. talks about that one in particular. Like, my girlfriend, anytime we see a log truck, brings it up. Yeah. Anytime I'm in the car of any kind of friend that gets brought Take up. Take the next Absolutely. overpass. Take the next exit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for real, I mean. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> so that just goes to like, it goes back into how like real life experiences are real life. Because sometimes you get hung up on stuff. Um, you know, even on the first one, we were, before we sold it to New Line, we had the, you know, Alex cheats death, death comes after them. You know, mm. they face off at the end. And Craig was like, 
you know, I feel like it needs something else, Jeff. And then it hit me that, you know, one night, like, well, what if there, what if there's a pattern? Like, what if there's a design to how death's killing them? What if he's killing them in the order that they would have died? And then that's like, that opens up a whole new portion of a story because then you give Alex something that he can potentially fight back with now. He's got some new knowledge that he didn't have before. And so now there's a chance that he can fight back as opposed to just running around being like, fuck, please, <laughs> death is after us. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Oh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about also, the... Oh, go ahead, Zuko. Well, I got one more. I, this is just a fan. This is just a fan question that uh, that I just want to ask. Um, <laughs> were the two FBI agents uh, based on Mulder and Scully? I don't think so. Um, because I, I know... Because from everything I've read, like, I haven't really talked to, to James and Glenn. I just knew their work and were fans of theirs. Mm. Um, but I don't think that... I think James said he didn't know about the X Files connection until after they made the movie, um, oh, okay. because I never submitted it. I never submitted it to the show. Like I just wrote it, and so it, that kind of came out when I, you know, started doing interviews when people wanted to know about the genesis of the project. So I think they wrote that completely separate. Um, but I don't know. They worked on the show, so may, that I, I, I shouldn't. Because James Wan had did um, come home, like the 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 yeah. The most- fine episode and i so i was just wondering if like i mean there's too many x-files connections there to like you know not not think about that yeah well i think they also probably work with you know they you know they're based out of canada so they probably work with like a lot of the same people um yeah you know, once you kind of get your creative team together you kind of in before in front of the camera or behind the camera you kind of stick with them so i think they probably work with a lot of the same people so there there definitely might have been I mean, I had the F- FBI show up in my spec script, but in the feature, I just had the police in there. So, okay. Just watching that interrogation scene, I I, I totally see that one FBI agent just being Mulder, just like oh yeah, that's, that's such a Mulder moment. Like I I believe him. <laughs> oh know? yeah, yeah. There's like that's such a Mulder moment. It's like oh, yeah. So, yeah I, I was just curious. Yeah, you know, and sometimes stuff ha- comes in there. Sometimes you put stuff in the movies intentionally, and sometimes you don't realize it until it's subconscious that you put something in there. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's awesome, man. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about our second film for this week too, uh, Tamara. Now, this is something you did a couple of years later in two thousand five, actually. Um, yeah. And real quick, Curtis, have you had a chance to watch this one? You said no. Unfortunately, not. I've just been no. very busy recently. I re- I remember bits and pieces. I do not think I've seen it all the way through, but there are parts I remember. Okay, I think I've seen was, the ending of the like the most. That was the position I was in until very recently when I had a chance to watch it all of its entirety. So I was okay. curious because again, same age kind of groups. This is something that was like circling around with us growing up, kind of deal. Oh, for sure. So feeling on that, and real quick as well, Giant. Is this is something you watched earlier on too. Uh, Tamara. Yeah. Actually, I missed this one on based on initial release. Um, I remember seeing the cover for it when I used to go to Blockbuster and Hollywood Video, and okay. I always confused it for Rage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Carrie, the Rage. Yeah, the yeah, because they both had the similar. Uh, they both had similar uh, poster art, so I, I always thought it was just like a Carrie sequel. I, I didn't realize it was his own thing, and then I had watched it um, this weekend or last weekend mm-hmm. rather, and I, I thought it was very entertaining. Yeah, man. I had fun with it. We're yeah, gonna get into it was, it. <laughs> it was a it that started off being like because I obviously Carrie was the inspiration for that because I love Carrie. Mm. Um, I just don't like that you have to wait till the end of the movie for Carrie to come back and and wreak wreak havoc. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to come up with the story, of, you know, because bullying I think is just another universal kind of thing that doesn't ever go away. Really, um, it's so funny because it, it outside of Final Destination, it is my favorite. But it's also a movie where originally, like, Lionsgate picked it up to put it out as a theatrical release mm-hmm. to distribute it, but they didn't invest in it. So then we end up getting private investors, and then some of the investors pulled out, and some of the investors ran away with some money. So then we didn't have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And then they also kind of watered the movie down um, in a lot of, like, there were a lot of edgier scenes that mm-hmm. were in the script that they toned down or took out completely. Oh, um, wow. So when Lionsgate saw it, they were like, we like it, but this is kind of like a PG version mm. 
of an R-rated movie that we wanted. So I have a I have a very soft spot for it because I I do enjoy it and you know and I even took a couple of like the the girl in the script it was going to be more like Gates of Blood like she's puking her intestines out. Mm. Um the 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 girl who's bullying me because that's how Carrie gets gets to these kids yeah. that bully her to death is she she find whatever secret they have she uses that against them so there one character who's you know bulimic like she, she was supposed to puke her guts out but we couldn't afford to do that um so she, I think the, she literally puked shit yeah it's just like <laughs> I, don't know, I mean that's what it looked like because like it was all brown and like oh. yeah like I don't know what she's puking up but it's still a fun. <laughs> it's still a really fun movie. Like I, I, and I'm not trying to like, not mm. try, like, I, cause I do, I do really enjoy watching it. It's just, I know what it could have been if we'd have had the proper budget. And also, I if, if is, they there, is there another version that you guys shot? That's, that's out there in the East? No, no, because it, we didn't have the money. Like we had, we, we shot it in like Winnipeg, which is mm. like that's... the, the, the least friendly yeah. place to shoot it in canada um and the, yeah the cast gave it their all but they, they didn't water anything down in the it's not like they shot a, a harder version of it it's okay, just gotcha. like like we couldn't do the effects to have her puking her intestines out um you know one of the the biggest scenes that probably would have should have bit stayed in there in my opinion but like there's two jocks that you know we find out that they roofied girls in the past and taken advantage of them so in the script like tamra puts you know uses her magic and she has one of the guys rape the other one and mm -hmm. nobody says anything about it you know when we're developing it when we're casting it when we're and then the day before they're supposed to shoot the scene they call me up they're like well how much should we show in this scene i'm like well it's not a sex scene it's a rape scene so just show whatever you would sh show yeah <laughs> like, but then they shot it because of certain behind the scenes shenanigans like people not nervous about doing the scene they turned it into like this weird scene where they start kissing and mm -hmm. it, yeah they're cuddling well, snuggling and together cuddling. Like, yeah they yeah, are like, the covers the man. <laughs> like it they totally so and that would have been the scene everybody was talking about like and then sure. she comes to the, the girlfriend comes to the room and sees him under the covers and pulls the sheet back and they've got their clothes on and they're like cuddling under the cover i'm like what are you that what did you shoot <laughs> like this is <laughs> this is not so it's like it, it's funny too because i'm watching that watching it and like it doesn't even phase her like oh like this is this isn't nothing new like it doesn't even phase her <laughs> oh yeah the way she felt it yeah yeah so there were that i st i still love the movie it's just i think i think probably uh, this the people that financed it the lionsgate was was ready they didn't have any notes on on any of of the whole story like mm -hmm. this is too intense or this is too dark um but i just think the investor people got you know they got nervous about stuff and then yeah so they just they just watered it down high. so okay. like you know you're still kind of you're still kind of they're still kind of walking this fine line post 9 11 they don't want to do anything to make any waves so i, I just feel yeah. like horror app after 2001 everyone just kind of want to like they didn't want no edge in, in yeah, everything mellowed out for a little bit. Yeah, everything. You know? And did. I feel like Edge didn't the, the edginess and horror didn't come back to like we got hostile. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me, hostile assault. That's yeah. when the Edge started to finally mm. come back. Yeah. And real quick, just to get our listeners caught up, a little bit of a recap of this film as well. Um, Tamara is kind of like this unattractive girl at school, and she has this crush on her teacher. And these group of like kids at her school kind of use that against her. And they trick her into, like, coming to a hotel room, and they set up a camera and basically, like, antagonize the hell out of this girl. Um, one girl, of course, is kind of, like, trying to be the, you know, the good one of the group, telling him not to mess with her, he like, shouldn't fuck with this girl. Um, but during this incident at this hotel room, uh, while they're antagonizing uh, Tamara, she's accidentally killed. But she's into witchcraft. And is brought back to life because her soul is tied with her teachers at this point. Um, their lives are bound together. And it's all about her getting like sexy revenge, more or less. <laughs> um, Jeffrey, I'm really curious because there's a different movie that came out that I'm sure Curtis and I are a bit more familiar with. Um, because it was pretty... It came out after my movie, if you're going to say Jennifer's Body. 
Yes, yeah. that's what I was saying. Yeah, it came out afterwards. <laughs> Do you think Jennifer oh, yeah. Bo- Jennifer's body was definitely inspired by this? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say that because the only reason I brought that up is because I know some people saw Jennifer's body and then saw Tamara, and they'd be. I'd see online where they're like, "He ripped off Jennifer's body." I'm like, "Do you guys not even look at release dates?" No, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. no, <laughs> they just look at the release date on YouTube and think that's that's gold right there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. people do that, man, 100. Yeah. percent but because I don't I look I at never... the, the comments on the trailer and it's the same thing. It's like, man, you, this came out four years early, man. If anything, Jennifer's body ripped this person off. Yeah. But I, I never having just worked in the business so long. Like, I don't I don't think people rip people off. Mm. Not, you know, uh, and let me just give you an example that just um, like cause, so I worked at New Line. I sold Final Destination to them and I move out to L.A. probably eight, nine years after the movie comes out. And I'm at a, at a party with some friends. And one of my friends is like elbowing his friend saying, tell Jeff the story. And the guy's like, no, no, no. I'm like, what, what? And he said, and so he finally tells me the story that he had written a comedy that was about a group of people who cheat death somehow. Mm. And death is like coming, coming after them. And he submitted it to New Line and they were like, oh, we're sorry. We just bought the horror version just like six months ago. So in my mind, I'm like, if he just sent that like six months earlier, not knowing, even not knowing how long we developed it, he would have thought, oh, Jeffrey ripped off my thing. And it's like, no, I've been developing this. You know, I wrote the X-Files script like four years before I sold, or three years before I sold the feature mm-hmm. to New Line. Like I've been working on this idea for ever, but so there's a lot of similar ideas that are floating around out there. Um, so I don't think that they ripped it off. I think, I think probably just the art. I mean, it is about two girls who die and come back. Um, well, I don't think it's a rip off necessarily. I was thinking, no, no, I think no. it's inspired by it all. Oh yeah. 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 No, I don't, uh, probably not. Okay. I mean, maybe, I don't know. It'd be, it'd be nice. Mm. <laughs> oh, Cody both, just called me up and she's like, yeah, I saw Tamara and got inspired. I'd be like, sweet. Yeah. Um, that'd be cool that. I don't know, man, because I've watched Jennifer's Body, and obviously, like, me being younger and growing up with, like, the Michael Bay Transformers stuff growing up, you know, Mega Fox is a big deal. Like, that was, you know, one of my first kind of childhood crushes kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so when I had a chance to finally watch Jennifer's, Jennifer's Body, I was not that impressed with it. Like, not the dog on someone else's movie for a second, but I, I kind of can't stand Jennifer's Body, you know? But I really liked Hammer for some reason. I, and I, I I'm in the same boat with you, Max. Like I didn't like yeah. Jennifer's body when I first saw it, mm-hmm. but like on a rewatch through a, a a new perspective, that movie is so good and it has so much relevancy. And that movie was just ahead of its time. Like it really was, mm-hmm. especially with its commentary, what it's saying about women and empowering. It's just it's on point. I mean, I, think I just that's feel Diablo cool. Cody was. I don't know. Man. I think she was ten years too early for that movie uh, just my and i think she i don't, I don't know man I, yeah 10 years too early i, I, I mean, can I see that, that man i hate the ending of jennifer's body now that whole yeah. scene is just ugly <laughs> but well i i, I, ahead, I agree on, on the ending but i think with jennifer's body too i i just remember they i think they mismarketed it too because all the marketing yeah. on Jennifer's body was like hey watch amanda siegfried and megan fox make out and yeah, I'm like, like okay, that was, that oh, she's the sexy killer. And you're like, ooh, yeah, no, like, that's, that's and, not what it is gonna, at all. And I'm like, that's going to maybe get some guys in the theater, but that's not, guys aren't, like, you need movies where your girlfriend's going to want to go see it. Mm-hmm. And your girlfriend's not going to be like, hey, let's go see this movie where Amanda Siegfried and Jen- Megan Fox make out the whole movie. Like, they, that's, <laughs> that was all their marketing was like, oh, they're going to make out. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Yep. It, there was so much more going on to it than I that. I remember Diablo Cody came out and said like she fucking hated the marketing to them. He's like, that's not what that's not what my movie is about. Like, yeah, like they yeah. totally missed. Maybe and I, so I felt bad for her in that regard. You know what I mean? Because like again, like we went, I went to see that movie for one reason. I'm not gonna lie, like to see, <laughs> um, you know, see that, and then yeah. like I had to go back and rewatch it again because you know what? I need it's, it's a fresh perspective and a French lens and a fresh lens. And that movie's in. I'm much more mature now, so I really, really get where she was going with it back then. Now I was like, God damn, this is actually a funny fucking movie, and it's really good. Maybe I need to rewatch it, man, for a different lens because it's been since I was a teenager. But you know, that's what I was expecting back then. Oh yeah, you know? no, but, yeah, hundred percent. That marketing was it, very misleading. But... It's one of those things too. Not to deviate too much, like. Mm-hmm. 
that was my thing too with like the movie Glorious Bastards. Really? Straight up marketed as an action movie. You yes. get it? It's maybe like the last ten minutes is an actual action. If thing. that. If yeah. that. <laughs> if and that's that. why I didn't like it the first time because I'm like, oh, where's all the action stuff? Why is everyone talking? Mm. I rewatched it recently. I'm like, oh, this movie's great. <laughs> yeah. It's I don't marketing, a lot of people don't understand marketing is such a big part of how movies get sold or like how audiences perceive them. It yeah. is, man. It's, You're right. It's well, it's also where like a lot of the money goes to. People are like, oh, this movie made this amount and they only had this budget. Like, and you go, well, God dang, kind of like marketing is a huge part of that mm-hmm. to get all of that out there. And I always say, if you have a good marketing team, the money will come in. It, just market it well first. That's the big thing. Yeah. Right, right. So maybe I need to watch Jennifer's Body again, man. Zuko, I'm going to drag you into that one. Another early morning Sounds recording good. like Zach and Mary. Give me a holla, dude. And I'll be there for real. I got you, brother. I got you. But. I think that's one of the reasons why I really enjoyed Tamara so much this time around. Because it kind of felt like what I wasn't expecting back then for Jennifer's body. Um, yeah, I thought the kills well, were cool in this. I thought, like, every, like, kind of one-liner she said was kind of cool, too. Oh, yeah. I really I enjoyed so this. <laughs> I had a lot of fun writing her. Like, it was just, mm-hmm. I'm just like, I'm just going to have her come back and just say the most inappropriate, like, you know, call the woman who can't have a kid a barren bitch. And, yeah, like, that know. was insane. <laughs> My mouth dropped when I heard it, that, man. <laughs> yeah, telling the teacher it's getting wet, and he's like, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh, the table, you know. So I, yeah. I had so much fun with that script. I imagine. Yeah, it was, it was a fun one to watch. It was just absolutely ridiculous. I loved it. <laughs> How did you come up on, like, um, did, were you a part of the, the approval of the casting? If so, how would you come up with, uh, how would you land on Jenna Dewan as being Tamara? Um, she just j- killed it, you know? Mm-hmm. She killed it. Um. Yeah, she killed it in the audition. Uh, she brought the. I mean, I did t- again. We didn't have the budget, so we couldn't do it. But my my thing was, I wanted them to make Tamara up to be unattractive because I'm like, guys, let's not just put her in saggy clothes and say she's unattractive when she obviously is attractive. Yeah, they don't want um, the glasses or move. The girl next to her, yeah, like, oh, she pulls down her hair now. She's just beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> but they didn't put glasses on her. But that's the only thing. Um, they did kind of give her a unibrow, but you can't really tell. Um, mm. but she just, she played both sides so well. She played the, the side that you feel bad for so well. Um, cause that, you know, I, I wanted to root, you know, you want to root for her. Um, but then there comes a point where it's like, okay, now you can't root for her anymore. Cause now she's going after everybody. Mm. Um, I, I think you root for her up until the point where she turns her focus on the teacher's wife. Yeah. And yeah. then that's kind of where you're like uh come on like you yeah know, she had nothing to do with you you know how you feel you know what i mean yeah like she's in the way of your love the love of your life but yeah like, you shouldn't focus on her like you need to focus on these other three motherfuckers over here yeah <laughs> yeah man, i really enjoyed this one for sure um ending caught me off guard as well as not expecting the teacher to go ahead and throw himself off to you know break the the curse more or less but yeah this was this was thoroughly a great watch i really enjoyed was there Tamara. ever talks of a sequel because of the yeah, way there, the- there, yeah there there were definitely there were talks of a sequel but with the rights like because mm. again these independent production companies got the rights and then one of them filed for bankrupt it's the whole so the rights are all like messed up so gotcha. i had a yeah i had a i had a had an idea for the for the sequel i mean it would obviously we couldn't do it now because everybody's, you know, it's been a long time. So yeah. not that you couldn't you can do, still it, do but... it now. Just make it, just make, uh, who is it? Marie Ellis older. Yeah. Well, what I, the funny thing is I wasn't going to, I was going to, this was just my original idea. It was like, you start off, you start off with, with Keisha, you know, mm-hmm. has a spell yeah. book and you think she's going to be the villain, but she ends up bringing, she's, she does a spell to bring Tamara back. And then, oh. Then as she's bringing Tamara back, she needs blood, and all of a sudden a woman comes up behind her and cuts her throat, and that's Tamara's mother, because we talked about her mother in the first one, teacher of witchcraft. So then I was going to have Tamara and her mother going after Chloe and the teacher, like, mm. years later. Like, they kind of pair up, you know, this this mother, which may may might have been cool, may not. I, I could still probably just go with Keisha being the, the new Tamara. Like, there's a <laughs> lot that- of ways to go, but... Yeah, because I thought I thought that's what exactly where you were heading with like that POV shot and her grabbing the book. Oh like, yeah. Oh, maybe the demon like did some fallen shit and like you know transferred into her. And yeah. So now that's Keisha, and now she's the demon. Like, oh, yeah. that would that would have been cool. Yeah. So there's a 
there's a lot of ways of yeah because it that's that movie i know does has done well you know for Lionsgate on because they just put it out on on dvd but mm -hmm. um i know it's done well because i still get some some residuals <laughs> some residuals not many but some and there, there are other least. projects there are other yeah. projects that i haven't gotten any residuals from so that's how you could kind of tell which ones mm -hmm. are doing okay gotcha Man, it's been great getting you on here, Jeffrey, to talk about these two movies. You know, of two course. of your films, of course, too. So it's even extra special. But... Oh, of course. Anytime. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been a blast, man. I think it's going to go ahead and wrap it up for this week, guys. Curtis, it's always a pleasure having you on here, brother. It's always thank a you, pleasure. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Where can the listeners find you if they don't follow you already? Uh, so uh, they... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm such a douchebag. I assume that was. <laughs> See how self centered I am? I'm so Hollywood. You're totally okay. <laughs> He's like, Curtis, it's been great talking to you. How can people find you? And I jump in and go, oh, here's how they. So <laughs> find me here, right here. <laughs> That's awesome. No, it's us. So people can follow me over at Twitch at twitch.tv slash Curtis Shack. Mm. Um, and for announcing it here, we haven't started yet, but our podcast is going to be called Code Zero. We okay. currently have an Instagram up. We have a Twitter account up right now, all at code underscore zero pod. Mm. Um, we're currently working with our artists to get our banner art and all that stuff taken care of. Um, okay, nice. So once she gets all that taken care of, we have some stuff in the production already. So we're thinking maybe end of December, start of January, first couple episodes. Very nice, man. Very nice. Awesome. Hell yeah, bro. And Johnny Zuko, it's always good to get you on here, bro. Always welcome back, man. Where can our listeners find you? For some reason, not following you already. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, and on TikTok at Zuko's Corner. Um, that's pretty much it, man. That's all I got. Good deal, brother. Good deal. Jeffrey, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here. I know we've been trying to make this episode happen for a while now. It's been an absolute blast. Would love to get you back on here again sometime. But where can our listeners find you and your work? Um, OnlyFans. Um, and the, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey... <laughs> Jeffrey A. Reddick on, on Twitter and Instagram, um, or in, I think TikTok too. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I, I mostly am on Twitter because that's just hmm. Instagram. You have to like sh be doing stuff and I'm just writing all the time. So it's like, oh, here's me writing at Starbucks Thanks. and writing <laughs> my yeah, living yeah. room. So it's not as exciting. So, but, um, but yeah, definitely. Awesome. I, I, I promote fil friends films and I give updates whenever I have any updates hmm. to give. So. Very nice, very nice. And links down below, guys, for all of our listeners as well to go ahead and have easy access for everything. But yeah, go ahead, guys. Stay tuned for next week. We got some more stuff coming up. Um, Jake dropped episode six of Awards Bait this week. Uh, no LFG coming next week either. I know we paused from last week, last month, excuse me, since we talked about the Marvels. Um, but also check out my most recent short film, No Vex. Uh, we do have a giveaway going on on our social media platforms as well, collaborating with Kayla Reed's for all the Hunger Games films. So check that out too. That goes on until December 12th. But also guys, we're still running the GoFundMe for my short film, Goonies and Agony. Um, we're currently through production with it right now. So we got about another two weeks for that GoFundMe to keep up. So link down below to check that out too, if you want. Each sharing helps as well, guys. Truly does. But stay tuned because we got a lot more coming for you before end of the month, before end of the year. Um, got some great, great things coming, guys. But thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider us leaving us an iTunes and Spotify review. It truly does help with the show much more than you can imagine. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Oh, this was a Galaxy of Film production. <laughs> <laughs>